Hey, lads, from the same class, from the same school. And uh, I went into training first in a, in a training pit, and I came back to the pit that I started on in, in Lewis Merthyr. That's the pit that's now closed because the coal board closed it. And um, I worked in then what were called timber faces. I worked on the coal, the coal face, and uh, the system was entirely different than what it is today. It was all manual work, shovels and punches and picks. And I worked in this face, and I've seen the changes slowly mm -hmm. uh, into um, modern type of face work. I transferred from uh, Lewis Merthyr in 1973 on my own accord to Mardi, and uh, because I was living in Mardi and I moved to be near my work. Of course, Mardi is a, a more modern pit. Uh, there were no timber faces in Mardi, it was machine faces. And, um, Could you describe a bit the method of working on the machine faces? Well, the machine faces is that um, the, you've got two types that we've had in Mardi. We had a plough, mm -hmm. and uh, now we've got a type of, um, whether it be a trepana or whether it be a range drum shearer, whatever it be, these are the two types of machines that have been used in Mardi. Uh, the, the system is entirely different than what I, what I was used mm -hmm. to in Lewis Merthyr, obviously because it's all machine mining. Um, the, I've never worked outside the coal face other than development, which is actually the same rate as a coal face worker. Yes. And that's about £29 a shift. Right. So I've always been in the thick of the work, in about the coal face or development. Mm -hmm. So that would be about 150 yeah. Well, you could call it an all round figure with about 150 pounds. But what you must realise, if, if we haven't any bonus, we roughly take home about 96, 97 pounds. That's our actual take home pay for working in the coal face. Right, and that's, that's top money, yeah. Yeah, and that's January 86. Yeah, and that's the top pay in the event. Right. Uh, now, I know all of you are involved in one way or another with, with the union. I wonder if you could just say, each of you, perhaps starting with you, Mike, how you got involved with the union and the sorts of jobs you've done within the union. Well, when I, when I left school, I say went into the pits, the, the, the main thing in the pits were the union. I mean, most men are union conscious in the pit. Uh, you never get many men going against the union because the union are the men. Um, every, every pit has got its lodge, which is a branch in some places outside, but they've got a lodge and they've got a committee. The committee is selected by the men in the pit on ballot votes. You have a lodge chairman, secretary, compensation, various positions that are all balloted for. But when you when you first went into the pits and you was mixed with these people, if you was interested in the union side, you went along to the meetings because the meetings are open. Mm -hmm. You had committee meetings, general meetings, and I generally got involved uh, in the late 50s and the early 60s um, with Lewis Murtha because of a young man. Had, 22, 23, I became the chairman of the Lewis Merthyr Lodge, which was difficult times then because of the pit closures in the 60s. But um, I've always enjoyed the union and uh, I don't think there's any time or other that I've ever voted against the union. I've always took the advice because to vote against the union realistically is foolish because you're voting against yourself. Mm -hmm. Because uh, everything comes from the rank and file. We get our ballots and it's a democratic union of course, men will have a kickback. You always have a kickback of, uh, of certain men in the ground. I've kicked myself and said, you know, no, this is wrong. But the process and the way it's run, we still have the right to decide our own future in the end. When you moved to Mardi, did you get heavily involved again in the No, uh, when I went to Mardi, the, the lodge was a strong lodge. There was, um, uh, I would say, that the lodge at the time, and I don't want to bring politics into this, was a, a communist type of lodge. It was yeah. controlled by people who were in the Communist Party, because not because they were communists, but because they were competent people at their job. Mm -hmm. They were elected every year, so, you know, and they were re-elected, so they were competent. Yeah. Looking after the interests of the movement. And even though I'd been a lodge official in the West Mills, I could see no point in just standing to be a lodge official. If you've got someone there that is doing the job and is good, mm -hmm. then there's no need to change him. Mm -hmm. If he's looking after the interests, anyway, if he wanted to be changed, the men would change him. There's no point in standing for a position just to be somebody. Right. You have a reason for doing yeah. it. But during the during the eighties, around the time of the strike, you've got more involved. Well, I've always been involved in the unions. Yeah. I've always been in the general meetings. And I've yeah. spoken in general meetings, and I've always tried to influence general meetings on the policy of the lodge mm -hmm. and the policy of the NUM. Right. Um, in the 
80s I was really involved. I was involved in the 83 strike with Lewis Murtha. Right. You know, I went up to Yorkshire along with Tony and John and the rest of us. Uh, trying to encourage the Yorkshire men to vote for a national strike on a ballot. Right. We was unsuccessful at the time because of the, the feeling in, in the coal fields. And uh, we came back disappointed over that. But um, that was in 83. And lo and behold, in 84, we looked on a national strike. And during that strike, what were you mainly involved in doing? In the 84 strike? Yes, in the 84, 85. Well, strike. the beginning of the strike, had done the same as everyone else, uh, picketing. But the union realised that this was going to be a long strike. We realised the government, because it had been taken over by the government strike. They respected it, they said they kept out of it. They were, they were telling the coal board what to do. They were more or less the whip hand. So we realised that we had to get in with support groups. And I got in with a support group, firstly in Birmingham and Wolverhampton, and then I went to Oxford. I spent about 10 months in Oxford, mm -hmm. working, raising funds for the South Wales area. Not for my pit, but for the whole of the area. Right. Well, we'll maybe come back to that and talk about the, the effect of that experience later on. But perhaps I could just turn to uh, to you, John, and say if you could just say a bit about your involvement in, in the union in the past and currently. <coughs> well, when I first went to number nine, that, that was the name of the colliery, number nine. Right. right. It's, uh, as a 15-year-old boy, I started with the lodge meetings. Yeah. Just because I was interested you know, in the union, I always believed in the union. But at 15, I was a bit. Was, the, was there a family background of involvement? No, no, there wasn't. Right. And no, my fa my family, you no, know, no politics whatsoever. Right. It's just something that happened to me. That's all. I right. went there's a 15 year old boy, not yeah. regularly, but you know, so once every three months, I got involved that way. Mm -hmm. And then when I transferred to Mardi, obviously because of the communist dominated lodge, you more or less had to get involved with the trade union. Mm -hmm. But uh, as for always doing what the union says, uh, I never believed in that. Mm -hmm. There's times when I have voted against the union, yeah. especially when it comes to wages, mm -hmm. when they've recommended us to accept a certain amount. Mm -hmm. I have always believed that the men in the mining industry are worth far more than what anyone can ever recommend. So I have voted against them on that issue. Mm -hmm. But on most issues, I have voted with the lodge right. and with the recommendation of the union. Right. And do you hold a lodge position now? Yes, I'm a surface representative now. On the committee? Yeah. And, but basically that is, I take the complaints from the surface people and pass it on to the dispute agent so he fetches up the disputes in the lodge. Right. And could you say a bit about what you were doing during the 84-85 during the strike? Well, it started off as soldiers, really, for want of a better word, you know, picketing. Yes. But as the strike went on, obviously, support groups had to be set up because the finance was needed because the money had run out in South Wales in the first week of the strike. Mm -hmm. There was no money. So we set up support groups, and thanks to the help of the Birmingham Trades Council, it's a plug from here, mm -hmm. but uh, things took off in Birmingham for us, and it was very successful. And you stayed quite a long time in Birmingham? St yes, 10 months. Tony, could you say a bit about your union involvement? Well, unlike Mike and John, I probably come late on the scene because um, as I was starting in the colliery at 15, my main interest until I was about 25 was sport. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, obviously you, you, working underground is dedication in itself because um, most of the old men are politically minded and you had your education of them, your basic education of the older men. And I used to listen, I used to question them, but I never went along to general meetings and I was never interest, interested in a position in the lodge as such, as a committee man or anything else. As I said, my main interest is sport. And at 25 years of age, um, my sporting career came to an end with a broken leg. And um, oh, was that rugby you played? Football, football, football. Yeah, uh, but, but the broken leg was in work, not um, mm -hmm. in actually playing football. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I took an interest not, not in the lodge so much as a, as a committee man, but as a safety convener mm -hmm. underground, because I'd been through the traumas of an accident myself, two accidents, and um, I had seen what could happen. And I decided then to, you know, see if I could better what was going on as a well, safety in the mines then. Right. And I've been interested in it ever since. And what do you, you hold a position in that area now? Yeah, no. Um, as I say, I'm 40 years of age now. I ten, 15 years as a safety convener. And um, I would never oppose the compensation secretary who was always been in Mardi because basically, as Mike and John have said, they've always been good people, you know, and if they've done the job well. But um, he retired at the end of the strike, and um, I put my name forward for this position, and I've, I've been elected. So you're a compensation 
um, secretary, Marty, now secretary, conversation yeah. secretary. What does that involve on a, on a weekly well, basis, as it were? Basically, what it means is you're representing the workforce as regards to the, they have an accident and they want to know how they go about a claim, mm -hmm. you know, against the coal board, obviously. Right. And um, I'm there as a kind of um, medium between the, the Ponty offices, solicitors, and the workman. Mm -hmm. And any kind of messages, uh, either way, I kind of transmit either way. Right. You know? Do you get a, an allowance off shift to, to do that? Yeah, well, what, what happens, you, fi you find that um, since I've taken this job, probably some weeks I work four days underground, some three, some two, and others I'm on kind of um, union duties then, right. as a conversation secretary. Okay. Right. What I want to do now is to just ask you or what for you was the single most important issue during the strike and then maybe uh, if you could just say a bit about how the strike affected you personally. Mike, perhaps you could start. Well obviously the, the most important issue was to win it. Mm -hmm. I mean, right from the word go, I never thought we could lose it. I was involved in victories in 72 and 74. We weren't, you know, we weren't using the same strategy as 72 and 74. It was obvious because the old climate had changed entirely because for the start we weren't, we wasn't fighting over wages. We was fighting over jobs. Mm -hmm. We were fighting because of our communities and it was a different type of strike. But I knew that with the cooperation and the solidarity of all the unions, there was no way we could be defeated. And that was the, you know, the most important issue. And um, as far as myself is concerned, uh, during the strike and working in Oxford and other people, uh, I seen the reality of the need to communicate with people from other unions, labor parties, the students. It was important to get the message across. Uh, the picketing side of it was important. But the most important side obviously was to go out to the people to put the case that wasn't being put across by the media to win the minds of the people that we were right in coming out on strike because we had no alternative, we didn't call the strike. I mean, <laughs> no union uh, was dependent on uh, coal and was in a situation like this that would come out, we'd say, in the summer. Mm -hmm. I mean, the effectiveness of a miners strike would obviously be in the winter That's right. when coal is uh, being used at the uh, is needed most. But, um, you know, looking back, the idea was to win the minds of the people, to tell the people why we were out. We were looking after a We were fighting for jobs, you know. We weren't fighting for pits where there was no coal. That's ludicrous. I mean, every miner knows you can't work in a pit where it's exhausted. Mm -hmm. But we had a situation where we could work in pits. Maybe if they weren't making a profit, that they could be made profitable. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have any alternative in other work. So, the idea of the strike was to bring to the attention of the people of this country what was happening in our industry, you know, because the media wasn't putting it across, for us to go out and give the message to other workers why, and that we were fighting for the security inside the industry. And that's what we tried to do. Right. John, can I just ask you how you saw the strike? How I saw the strike? In terms of the defeat? Yes, in general. Well, maybe talk about the defeat, yeah, yes. Well, Obviously, we was all full of optimism at the start of the strike, and I honestly believed we had won the strike in the first week. But the NUM dropped a blunder, and a, a terrific blunder it proved to be at the end, where they withdrew the pickets from Nottinghamshire. Because mm -hmm. on the Wednesday of that week, and unfortunately, Davy Jones got killed. This would be in March. Well, the first week of the strike. Surprised, yeah. The Nottinghamshire coalfield came to a complete stop. There wasn't one pit working on the Thursday. And the, under some promise, I don't know who made the promises, that the, the ballot would be guaranteed there would be a strike in Nottinghamshire. The pickets were withdrawn. Well, on that weekend, the police moved in and filled the vacuum that was created by the withdrawal of the pickets. And once the police were in there, there was no way that the pickets were going to get back into Nottinghamshire. And I think that's where the strike was lost, really. But obviously the optimism kept going for a long time. And Especially when the winter came along, I thought we could have done something then, but wasn't to be. How did the, the experience of being on strike for that length of time and spending a lot of time away from home affect you personally? Well, physically nothing really but financially it cost me in the region of £10,000 mm -hmm. with a loss of wages because on the job I have there is a lot of overtime to be worked mm -hmm. so my wages were £8,000 per year mm -hmm. so I, I lost the £8,000 wages for that year it also cost me £2,000 of my savings to be on strike for 12 months. Yeah. But I would go through it again to save the union. 
So at the end of the day, money isn't a thing. We weren't fighting for money. It was for pits and jobs and right. for communities.